The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells. Chapter Eleven. In the Coach and Horses. Now, in order to clearly understand what had happened in the inn, it is necessary to go back to the moment when Mister Marvel first came into view of Mister Huxter's window. At that precise moment, Mister Cuss and Mister Bunting were in the parlour. They were seriously investigating the strange occurrences of the morning, and were, with Mr. Hall's permission, making a thorough examination of the invisible man's belongings. Jaffers had partially recovered from his fall, and had gone home in charge of his sympathetic friends. The stranger's scattered garments had been removed by Mrs. Hall, and the room tidied up. And on the table, under the window where the stranger had been wont to work, Cuss had hit almost at once on three big books in manuscript, labelled diary. Diary, said Cuss, putting the three books on the table. Now, at any rate, we shall learn something. The vicar stood with his hands on the table. Diary, repeated Cuss, sitting down, putting two volumes to support the third, and opening it. Hmm, no name on the fly-leaf. Bother, cipher, and figures. The vicar came round to look over his shoulder. Cuss turned the pages over with a face suddenly disappointed. I'm... Oh, dear me, it's all cipher, Bunting. There are no diagrams, asked Mr. Bunting. No illustrations throwing light? See for yourself, said Mr. Cuss. Some of it's mathematical, and some of it's Russian, or some such language, to judge by the letters. And some of it's Greek. Now, the Greek I thought you... Of course, said Mr. Bunting, taking out and wiping his spectacles, and feeling suddenly very uncomfortable for he had no Greek left in his mind worth talking about. Yes, the Greek, of course, may furnish a clue. I'll find you a place. I'd rather glance through the volumes first, said Mr. Bunting, still wiping. A general impression first, cousin. Then, you know, we can go looking for clues. He coughed, put on his glasses, arranged them fastidiously, coughed again, and wished something would happen to avert the seemingly inevitable exposure. Then he took the volume Cuss handed him in a leisurely manner, and then something did happen. The door opened suddenly. Both gentlemen started violently, looked around, and were relieved to see a sporadically rosy face beneath a furry silk hat. Tap? asked the face, and stood staring. No, said both gentlemen at once. Over the other side, my man, said Mr. Bunting, and please shut that door said Mr. Cuss, irritably. "'All right,' said the intruder, as it seemed in a low voice curiously different from the huskiness of its first inquiry. "'Right you are,' said the intruder in the former voice. "'Stand clear.' And he vanished and closed the door. "'A sailor, I should judge,' said Mr. Bunting. "'Amusing fellows they are. Stand clear, indeed. A nautical term referring to his getting back out of the room, I suppose.' "'I dare say so,' said Cuss. "'My nerves are all loose to-day. "'It made me quite jump, the door opening like that.' "'Mr. Bunting smiled as if he had not jumped. "'And now,' he said with a sigh, "'these books.' "'Someone sniffed as he did so. "'One thing is indisputable,' said Bunting, "'drawing a chair up next to that of Mr. Cuss. "'There certainly have been very strange things "'happening at Iping during the last few days.' "'Very strange. "'I cannot, of course, believe in this absurd invisibility story.' "'It's incredible,' said Cuss, "'incredible, but the fact remains that I saw, "'I certainly saw, right down his sleeve. "'But did you... are you sure? "'Suppose a mirror, for instance. "'Hallucinations are so easily produced. "'I don't know if you've ever seen a really good conjurer.' "'I won't argue again,' said Cuss. "'We've thrashed that out, Bunting. "'And just now there's these books. "'Ah, here's some of what I take to be Greek. "'Greek letters, certainly.' "'He pointed to the middle of the page. "'Mr. Bunting flushed slightly and brought his face nearer, "'apparently finding some difficulty with his glasses. "'Suddenly he became aware of a strange feeling at the nape of his neck.' He tried to raise his head, and encountered an immovable resistance. The feeling was a curious pressure, the grip of a heavy, firm hand, and it bore his chin irresistibly to the table. "'Don't move, little men,' whispered a voice, "'or I'll brain you both.' 
Mr. Bunting looked into the face of Cuss, close to his own, and each saw a horrified reflection of his own sickly astonishment. "'I'm sorry to handle you so roughly,' said the voice, "'but it's unavoidable. "'Since when did you learn to pry into an investigator's private memoranda?' said the voice, and two chins struck the table simultaneously, and two sets of teeth rattled. "'Since when did you learn to invade the private rooms of a man in misfortune?' And the concussion was repeated. "'Where have they put my clothes?' "'Listen,' said the voice, "'the windows are fastened, and I've taken the key out of the door. I am a fairly strong man, and I have the poker handy. Besides, being invisible. There's not the slightest doubt that I could kill you both and get away quite easily if I wanted to. Do you understand? Very well. If I let you go, will you promise not to try any nonsense and do what I tell you? The vicar and the doctor looked at one another, and the doctor pulled a face. Yes, said Mr. Bunting, and the doctor repeated it. Then the pressure on the necks relaxed, and the doctor and the vicar sat up both very red in the face, and wriggling their heads. "'Please keep sitting where you are,' said the invisible man. "'Here's the poker, you see.' "'When I came into this room,' continued the invisible man, after presenting the poker to the tip of the nose of each of his visitors, "'I did not expect to find it occupied, and I expected to find, in addition to my books of memoranda, an outfit of clothing. Where is it? No, don't rise. I can see it's gone.' Now, just at present, though the days are quite warm enough for an invisible man to run about stark, the evenings are quite chilly. I want clothing and other accommodation, and I must also have those three books. Chapter 12 The Invisible Man Loses His Temper It is unavoidable that at this point the narrative should break off again for a certain very painful reason that will presently be apparent. While these things were going on in the parlour, and while Mr. Huxter was watching Mr. Marvel smoking his pipe against the gate not a dozen yards away, Mr. Hall and Teddy Henfrey were discussing in a state of cloudy puzzlement the one iping topic. Suddenly there came a violent thud against the door of the parlour, a sharp cry, and then silence. Hello, said Teddy Henfrey. Hello, from the tap. Mr. Hall took things in slowly but surely. That ain't right, he said, and came round from behind the bar towards the parlour door. He and Teddy approached the door together with intent faces. Their eyes considered. Somewhat wrong, said Hall, and Henfrey nodded agreement. Whiffs of an unpleasant chemical odour met them. There was a muffled sound of conversation, very rapid and subdued. "'You all right there?' asked Hall, rapping. The muttered conversation ceased abruptly. For a moment, silence. Then the conversation was resumed in hissing whispers. Then a sharp cry of, "'No, no, you don't.' There came a sudden motion and the oversetting of a chair. A brief struggle. Silence again. "'What the deuce?' exclaimed Henfrey, sotto voce. "'You all right there?' asked Mr. Hall, sharply, again. The vicar's voice answered with a curious, jerking intonation. Co co "'Quite right. Please don't interrupt.' "'Odd,' said Mr. Henfrey. "'Odd,' said Mr. Hall. "'Says don't interrupt,' said Henfrey. "'I heard him,' said Hall. "'And a sniff,' said Henfrey. They remained listening. The conversation was rapid and subdued. "'I can't,' said Mr. Bunting, his voice rising. "'I tell you, sir, I will not.' "'What was that?' asked Henfrey. "'Says he winnert. "'Weren't speaking to us, was he?' "'Disgraceful,' said Mr. Bunting within. "'Disgraceful,' said Mr. Henfrey. "'I heard it distinct.' "'Who's that speaking now?' asked Henfrey. "'Mr. Cuss, I suppose,' said Hall. "'Can you hear anything?' Silence. The sounds within indistinct and perplexing. "'Sounds like throwing the tablecloth about,' said Hall. Mrs. Hall appeared behind the bar. 
Hall made gestures of silence and invitation. This aroused Mrs. Hall's wifely opposition. "'What you listening there for, Hall? Ain't you nothing better to do, busy day like this?' Hall tried to convey everything by grimaces and dumb show, but Mrs. Hall was obdurate. She raised her voice. So Hall and Henfrey, rather crestfallen, tiptoed back to the bar, gesticulating to explain to her. At first she refused to see anything in what they had heard at all. Then she insisted on Hall keeping silence while Henfrey told her his story. She was inclined to think the whole business nonsense. Perhaps they were just moving the furniture about. "'I heard and say disgraceful.' "'That I did,' said Hall. "'I heard that, Mrs. Hall,' said Henfrey. "'Like as not,' began Mrs. Hall. "'Shh!' said Mr. Teddy Henfrey. "'Didn't I hear the window?' "'What window?' asked Mrs. Hall. "'Parlour window,' said Henfrey. Everyone stood listening intently. Mrs. Hall's eyes, directed straight before her, saw without seeing the brilliant oblong of the inn door, the road white and vivid, and Huxter's shop front blistering in the June sun. Abruptly Huxter's door opened, and Huxter appeared, eyes staring with excitement, arms gesticulating. "'Yap!' cried Hunter. "'Stop thief!' And he ran obliquely across the oblong towards the yard gates and vanished. Simultaneously came a tumult from the parlour, and a sound of windows being closed. Hall, Henfrey, and the human contents of the tap rushed out at once pell-mell into the street. They saw someone whisk around the corner towards the road, and Mr. Huxter executing a complicated leap in the air that ended on his face and shoulder. Down the street people were standing astonished or running towards them. Mr. Huxter was stunned. Henfrey stopped to discover this, but Hall and the two labourers from the tap rushed at once to the corner, shouting incoherent things and saw Mr. Marvel vanishing by the corner of the church wall. They appear to have jumped to the impossible conclusion that this was the invisible man suddenly become visible, and set off at once along the lane in pursuit. But Hall had hardly run a dozen yards before he gave a loud shout of astonishment, and went flying headlong sideways, clutching one of the labourers and bringing him to the ground. He had been charged just as one charges a man at football. The second labourer came round in a circle, stared, and conceiving that Hall had tumbled over of his own accord, turned to resume the pursuit, only to be tripped by the ankle just as Huxter had been. Then, as the first labourer struggled to his feet, he was kicked sideways by a blow that might have felled an ox. As he went down, the rush from the direction of the village green came round the corner. The first to appear was the proprietor of the coconut shy, a burly man in blue jersey. He was astonished to see the lane empty, save for three men sprawling absurdly on the ground. And then something happened to his rearmost foot, and he went headlong and rolled sideways just in time to graze the feet of his brother and partner, following headlong. The two were then kicked, knelt on, fallen over, and cursed by quite a number of over-hasty people. Now, when Hall and Henfrey and the labourers ran out of the house, Mrs. Hall, who had been disciplined by years of experience, remained in the bar next to the till. And suddenly the parlour door was opened and Mr. Cuss appeared, and without glancing at her, rushed at once down the steps round the corner. "'Hold him!' he cried. "'Don't let him drop that parcel!' He knew nothing of the existence of Marvel, for the invisible man had handed over the books and bundle in the yard. The face of Mr. Cuss was angry and resolute, but his costume was defective a sort of limp white kilt that could only have passed muster in Greece. "'Hold him!' he bawled. "'He's got my trousers and every stitch of the vicar's clothes.' "'Tend to him in a minute,' he cried to Henfrey as he passed the prostrate huckster, and, coming round the corner to join the tumult, was promptly knocked off his feet into an indecorous sprawl. Somebody in full flight trod heavily on his finger. He yelled, struggled to regain his feet, was knocked against and thrown on all fours again, and became aware that he was involved not in a capture, but a rout. Everyone was running back to the village. He rose again and was hit severely behind the ear. He staggered and set off back to the coach and horses forthwith, leaping over the deserted huckster who was now sitting up on his way. Behind him, as he was halfway up the inn steps, he heard a sudden yell of rage rising sharply out of the confusion of cries, and a sounding smack in someone's face. He recognised the voice, 
as that of the invisible man, and the note was that of a man suddenly infuriated by a painful blow. In another moment Mr. Cuss was back in the parlour. "'He's coming back, Bunting,' he said, rushing in. "'Save yourself!' Mr. Bunting was standing in the window, engaged in an attempt to clothe himself in the hearth-rug and a West Surrey gazette. "'Who's coming?' he said, so startled that his costume narrowly escaped disintegration. "'Invisible man,' said Cuss, and rushed on to the window. "'We'd better clear out from here. He's fighting mad. Mad!' In another moment he was out in the yard. "'Good heavens!' said Mr. Bunting, hesitating between two horrible alternatives. He heard a frightful struggle in the passage of the inn, and his decision was made. He clambered out of the window, adjusted his costume hastily, and fled up the village as fast as his fat little legs would carry him. From the moment when the invisible man screamed with rage, and Mr. Bunting made his memorable flight up the village, it became impossible to give a consecutive account of affairs in Iping. Possibly the Invisible Man's original intention was simply to cover Marvel's retreat with the clothes and books, but his temper, at no time very good, seems to have gone completely at some chance blow, and forthwith he set to smiting and overthrowing for the mere satisfaction of hurting. You must figure the street full of running figures, of doors slamming and fights for hiding places. You must figure the tumult suddenly striking on the unstable equilibrium of old Fletcher's planks and two chairs with cataclysmic results. You must figure an appalled couple caught dismally in a swing. And then the whole tumultuous rush has passed, and the Iping Street with its gourds and flags is deserted, save for the still raging unseen, and littered with coconuts, overthrown canvas screens, and the scattered stock in trade of a sweetstuff stall. Everywhere there is a sound of closing shutters and shoving bolts, and the only visible humanity is an occasional flitting eye under a raised eyebrow in the corner of a window-pane. The invisible man amused himself for a little while by breaking all the windows in the coach and horses, and then he thrust a street-lamp through the parlour window of Mrs. Gribble. He, it must have been, who cut the telegraph wire to Adderdean just beyond Higgins's cottage on the Adderdean road and, after that, as his peculiar qualities allowed, he passed out of human perceptions altogether, and he was neither heard, seen, nor felt in Iping any more. He vanished absolutely. But it was the best part of two hours before any human being ventured out again into the desolation of an Iping street. End of chapter 12